giving of your time and insight uh, uh, later on a Friday night. Um, um, I, uh, in a short while, uh, rather than introducing you, can I suggest that you introduce yourselves? I like to think that you know yourselves better than I do, so you, you'd probably be better to hear your own introduction. Just to correct the introduction I was given, I'm um, adjunct associate professor. The adjunct matters. I come from the outside world in, uh, as far as um, um, academia is concerned. I'm a practitioner. I have worked with clients um, all over the world, but particularly in, in the Middle East and North Africa. Currently, I have client assignments uh, with businesses in Dubai and in Somalia. I've worked with businesses in Kuwait and Abu Dhabi um, um, as well. Um, I ended up in Jordan by mistake when my plane got diverted, but I've never done any work there. Um, as far as teaching is concerned, I teach courses on uh, entrepreneurship at London Business School and elsewhere, and I co-teach a course on entrepreneurship in emerging markets. Um, uh, it's uh, an, an area of a considerable fascination to me, the world of entrepreneurship, and the world of the Middle East as well is one that I'm particularly interested in. After we've heard our guests introduce uh, themselves, I want to put a few themes on the table, and then maybe we can broaden our discussion from there. But m m may I invite our guests to introduce themselves briefly? Who, 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 sir, would you like to start? Oh, please, at the end there. Ladies first. Yes. Go on. Lovely, love to start. Uh, so hi, my name's Aurora Belfrag. Uh, I'm Swedish by nationality, but lived in Saudi Arabia as a child. Uh, my background's in entrepreneurship, so I've founded and co-founded a few different businesses. Uh, the most well-known is a very hyped company that we founded in Stockholm 2011 called Rap. That is a classic startup saga, hailed as heroes and then deemed as disasters and then hailed as heroes again and disasters. And we did the famous pivot which is a savior for entrepreneurs because that means you can have a fancy word for realizing your first idea is shit, but you get a new opportunity to build something else. And uh, we had a famous uh, investor, so the founder of Skype, Nicholas Sandstrom, invested in us early. The founder of LinkedIn, Reid Hoffman, invested in us early. We opened markets, we closed markets, um, and then um, moved to the valley, um, and Pivot came from there. The last two years, I've been working in the Middle East in the tech startup scene because of my childhood experience in Saudi Arabia. I've loved the region always as a tourist, the food, uh, the people. And I was sitting in a pivotal dinner where someone said, Aurora, you're in the region all the time. Tell us, what does the tech scene look like? Uh, and I couldn't answer. And I'm a bit of a know-it-all, so I immediately Googled and realized what you guys all know, that there's a booming tech scene and a startup scene in the region. And then incrementally, um, things unfolded, and I spent two years doing a show about the bullshit of startups and how hard it is to build a business, and used some of the anecdotal stories in, uh, in my experience. Humor as a tool, which is something that I... I believe in, and uh, went to Istanbul, to Dubai, to Amman, to Tunis, to Erbil, to Iraq, uh, to Qatar, to Cairo, to Riyadh, to Beirut, where we had our final event in uh, 2015, um, and met the whole startup scene, the ecosystem, the entrepreneurs, the investors, and I did some angel investments, worked with some of the VCs in the region, but also worked as uh, a policy advisor to some of the governments. Now I'm back in Europe, I do still some work in the region, mainly for Syrian entrepreneurs on a pro bono basis. And um, now we've uh, built a big fund for, for European investments and I'm honored to be here uh, to talk about uh, Mina again. Thank Sorry, that was wrong. Much. Thank you very much. Guest number two, please, who are you? <clears throat> <laughs> Hi everyone, um, my name is Tariq Saadi. I've, I've spent most of my career working in, entrepreneur, in entrepreneurship with entrepreneurs as an entrepreneur myself and as an investor. I started off my career uh, after college with setting up two businesses in uh, Mexico that I uh, exited. Um, I uh, joined uh, Merrill Lynch as an investment banker focusing on the TMT sector in uh, 2001 after I graduated from London Business School. And that was a really interesting time to look at technology because everything was tanking. So you really learn the hard lessons uh, of entrepreneurship and you know how, uh, how cruel technology can be when it's still being proven, all these different business models are being created and, uh, and being launched. <clears throat> after, uh, after Merrill Lynch, I set up a VC fund here in London focusing on uh, tech companies uh, in, uh, in Europe. 
and then moved on to the Middle East. I worked for a private equity group that focused on emerging markets. Um, in the SME space, or so more on the middle space as opposed to the entrepreneurship, uh, uh, the early tech entrepreneurship space. And in 2009, when uh, the world uh, imploded, I left Dubai and went back to uh, my country of origin, which is Lebanon, and uh, raised a VC fund there. After a year of uh, investing in venture capital and working with entrepreneurs in Lebanon, I, f I recognized my passion to, really what I wanted to do is having come back, having had all that experience uh, outside of uh, the Middle East and outside, of, uh, and outside of Lebanon particularly, I wanted to give back to the country. So I launched the uh, local uh, affiliate of Endeavor, which is a global organization that's uh, focused on job creation and transforming economies through the power of entrepreneurship. So I've been doing that since uh, 2010. We uh, look at uh, entrepreneurs that we call high impact entrepreneurs, so entrepreneurs that will have a disproportionate impact on their ecosystems, uh, entrepreneurs that will become the large successful businesses of, uh, of tomorrow. That's given me a particular uh, bird's eye view of uh, entrepreneurship in Lebanon and in the Middle East and the challenges that we're uh, facing and um, you know, a good idea of the road uh, ahead, which hopefully I'll be sharing with you today. Thank you. Tarek, thank you very much. Please. Hi, my name is Iyad, and uh, I started my career at academia. So I was at uh, university making researches, and then uh, an investor called me um, while I was uh, doing postdoc, and he told me, like, uh, Iyad, what are you doing? I told him I'm doing something good for the world, like research. He said, okay, go to the Middle East and sell pizza, fashion, and use cars. I said, okay, that sounds great. So the investor was Oliver Zumber, um, and it was Rocket Internet, so I founded uh, it in the Middle East. Since then, this was like five or six years ago. Um, we are today now at 2,000 employees, I think. We are doing 100,000s of transactions every day. It has been an incredible uh, adventure until then, and uh, we founded companies like Nemshi.com, many of you might know it, um, and Dwadi, a lot of food companies, etc. Um, so when people like ask me why I went to the Middle East and not uh, to found uh, something in the Silicon Valley or in Europe, um, I, think, I think emerging markets are the best places to go as entrepreneurs because, um, not because they are nice, I mean, Dubai has nice beaches, um, but we went also to other more complicated countries. It's, it's, um, it's a place, uh, as an entrepreneur, as a scientist, you should always look for probably where there's least competition, not most competition. Um, if you go to the Silicon Valley, you have the smartest people and the most cash, right? Uh, if you go to emerging markets, you have not so much ma uh, cash um, and you have less competition with um, a super strong entrepreneur. So, so you can build something much bigger. You can uh, you have a much bigger success probability. So how I compare it is, if you're looking for a pretty girl to marry, you probably don't go to the billionaire's golf club, but you go to uh, University of Berlin, where you have like uh, the pretty girls and the poor guys. Um, go for the smart girls. <laughs> yes, smart and pretty. Um, so it's the same. <laughs> uh, it's the same like in the um, entrepreneurship world. And that's, um, that's what we did. Thank um, you. I should quit while you're ahead, if I were you. So it's an important lesson in entrepreneurship. Please, guest number four. Uh, my name is Amr Abul Azm. Uh, I'm not going to talk about smart and pretty girls, but uh, uh, I come from Egypt, and uh, I think I'm privileged to be here today because uh, I've, I've been observing a lot uh, what's been happening lately in the Middle East in terms of entrepreneurship development because I carry several hats, and... Uh, one thing, one observation that has to be clear to everyone, since the majority of, of, of the friends with us today are uh, quite younger than me, is that you've had the opportunity to choose. You've had the opportunity to choose between starting uh, a career with a company or a mainstream job or to actually be an entrepreneur and start a startup. Because back in the days, we were not really faced with such choices. We were just heading towards the best job available and the best career. There wasn't such a hype on uh, startups, such a hype on entrepreneurship, such a hype on 
striking lucky with a startup and making a story. So it's something that you have to bear in mind today. Um, I come with, with, with a professional history of 25 years work. I've, uh, I started as, uh, as a credit officer in a very good bank in Egypt called CIB. Then I decided that banking is not the career. At that stage, I moved into development, and I said that I want to help people, and this was a very enriching experience. Uh, back in the days, in the 90s, Egypt was embarking on a very interesting program called the Economic Reform Program and Structure Adjustment. And I found an, a very interesting task within the government at that stage, financed by UN, had to pay well, of course, uh, to help the people of Egypt, and it was extremely enriching. At that stage, I, I, I started to read about microfinance and how microfinance can help people uh, in terms of providing jobs, incomes, and ultimately alleviating poverty. And it became so interesting to me that uh, I started to study it academically, like you guys are starting to study academically or are going into the academia in an area that you like. Uh, as I fell in love with microfinance, I started thinking at that stage of how to make money out of microfinance. And then came the idea of commercialization of microfinance. Uh, again, um, I found one way of doing it and to enrich myself is to join an organization that helped micro entrepreneurs. It's a governmental organization that turned out to be not so efficient as I thought at that stage. But it was extremely enriching as I uh, learned a lot in that field, dealing with uh, different type of people who want to start their business, who are seeking finance, and we started to do business in a different way. Uh, I had an opportunity to go back in, in one of the major banks in Europe called KFW, German Development Bank, which was the largest development bank, still is the largest government bank in Europe. And I worked for some time structuring uh, investment projects for micro-entrepreneurs. And as an APEX organization, we financed several banks who did work for micro-entrepreneurs. At the age of 38, which is quite late for you guys, I started to think that I should have my own startup. So I joined some friends. We started to look for equity. We ended up with an institution, an investment bank in the region called Citadel Capital. And one of the Egyptian banks, he fell in love with the idea and he started to finance our portfolio called the Egyptian Gulf Bank at that stage. Uh, we started out very successfully. Then came the uh, Arab Spring or Arab Winter as some call it. I personally think it was a good change for, for some countries in the region. I think it had a lot of positive impact. There were some diversions taking place, but I'm not gonna go into politics, but it was a change. It was a good change at that stage. So we basically almost went bankrupt as people stopped paying us their debt. Our portfolio at risk went from 4% to 25% overnight. We had to do a capital increase. We were diluted overnight, and we basically faced bankruptcy and we almost shut down. At that stage, we, we decided as partners that we're not gonna get paid for like three to six months. We had to use our savings or what was remaining of our savings. And we started to exert more control, different approaches in collection. And we thought that this was the time actually to, to dig deep and survive. We reaped the benefits uh, four years later as the company was quite profitable became the largest microfinance company in the Man region with the largest outreach, largest portfolio. And uh, it was sold to the largest investment bank in the region, EFGRMS, about a year ago. Actually, coming back to think about all this and uh, about the enriching experience that I had without going into details, I think that uh, personally I'm back to that stage again <laughs> where I'm thinking that there should be uh, a desire to start new businesses, even if you're old like me, compared to your age, of course. There is always a desire to start a new venture. There's always a desire to get a spark back again. And when you stay at one place for, for some time, you begin to think of different opportunities. Now, there are opportunities I'll speak about in terms of fintech solutions for outreach, uh, solutions that are re related to technology and delivery mechanisms that are totally unorthodox to most of the Mena region's ways of delivering financial services that carry a lot of anti-potential. Um, I have failed also in the middle, and I never thought that it was embarrassing to fail in the middle. Actually, the, we, I had a failure in one of the businesses in the middle while I was having my, the success of, of the company that I co-founded, 
and it was more enriching than all the experience I had in my company. Uh, and this is something that we all have to understand that the, the, the failures teach you a lot more than the successes. And as many have mentioned before, uh, this is a culture that is not taught, but a culture that you learn through starting a business and failing once, twice, and three times until you strike it lucky and make it happen. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Our panel, ladies and gentlemen. Now I'm going to invite our guests to comment if, uh, uh, if uh, uh, they can, well, I'm sure they can, in, in, in a minute on entrepreneurship in the region, um, the, uh, what's changing in the environment to make uh, entrepreneurship as uh, to be more fruitful, more likely to seed, more likely to be the starting of uh, uh, successful growth ventures um, in, in the region. Uh, and I'll ask our, our guests in turn to comment on that. And as we do so, I encourage us all to reflect on some of the key issues, themes, obstacles, levers, routes to growth that are typical for all businesses around the world and invite us to reflect on what's changing in the Middle East at the moment to make things easier for us as entrepreneurs or more difficult for us as entrepreneurs. Of course, we need to start with people. Our guests already show an astonishing range of diversity in terms of experience, both as business founders and financiers. Uh, at the heart of any entrepreneurial venture, of course, has to be an entrepreneur, uh, or a, serious, a team of entrepreneurs at least, people who want to start a business rather than to join a big one. As one of our guests has already said, uh, when he started out, there, you know, there was, was, wasn't much choice. You went into a big business or you went into nothing. Entrepreneurship as a choice, is that changing in the region um, in 2017? Are attitudes to entrepreneurship changing? As George W. Bush famously said in France, the problem with the French is they've got no word for entrepreneur. What about in the Middle East? You know, have we got uh, attitudes to entrepreneurship now uh, that we didn't have 10, 15, 20, even five years ago? What about the regulatory environment? To what extent does the regulatory environment foster conditions that make entrepreneurship more likely to take root, make it more likely that individuals are going to take the risk with their reputation and their fortune down the entrepreneurial path, face up to the inevitability of failure? You will fail if you start out as an entrepreneur. What about opportunity and opportunity costs? We have choices. We have choices as investors, whether we choose to invest in the Middle East or invest our money elsewhere. We have choices as entrepreneurs. We don't have to necessarily be entrepreneurs in the Middle East. Part show Donald Trump, of course. We could go somewhere else in the world and do it. What's different now that makes it more likely that the Middle East is going to suck talent back into it and keep it, rather than send it out to provide entrepreneurial opportunities elsewhere in the world? And then finance, of course. What's true of individuals is also true of finance. And then backing up any entrepreneur is going to be a team, team of talent. I, I eavesdropped on one of our speakers suggesting that the problem when you educate people is they go somewhere else. Uh, well, well, this is reality around the world, of course. Uh, to what extent can we build and retain teams in the Middle East to take our businesses to the next stage of evolution? Somebody once told me that one of the advantages of setting up a business in a little country like Israel is that if you want to be successful, you've got to get out. There's no point sticking within. That's no doubt true of the Emirates, of course. No doubt true of other jurisdictions and re, um, countries in the Middle East. But to what extent do we make it easy for our entrepreneurial businesses to grow, to grow beyond the boundaries that create them, to grow beyond the region? To what extent are our entrepreneurial businesses going to be just local businesses or the genuine world changers of the future? Founded not in Sacramento, not in Silicon Valley, not in Old Street London, but in Dubai or Jeddah or, or, or somewhere else in the region. That series of growth prospects is something that we need to face up to as well, is it not? Um, okay, I've, I've whittled on long enough. Hopefully I've given our speakers time to collect their thoughts. Or I think you've had more time than most. Would you like to comment? Would I like to comment? And now I know why they gave me a pen and paper. So there were so many interesting things there to, to comment on. And I think 
Um, a few things that come to mind for me is obviously there's a huge opportunity uh, in the region. There's a lot of talent. And every time I go and at all different parts of the region demonstrate a huge hunger and passion. And there's a lot of technology talent as well. Um, I'd like to highlight two of the main challenges that I see that one can take practical steps towards maturing the ecosystem, so to speak. And one is on the investor side. It's very easy to talk about there's not enough startups, and, and, and I think you'll agree with me that a, a lot of the VC banter is where is the startup, where is the talent, we're looking for it, etc. And to a degree it's true, I'm not going to go into the, to that debate. I'd like to though comment on the investor side. And if you look at mature startup ecosystems, London, Stockholm, uh, Silicon Valley of course, the capital comes with experience. They are second, third generation entrepreneurs. They've built, they've understood. And the main assumption that I think everyone needs to have is, it's really, really difficult to build a business. And everything can go wrong and everything will go wrong. So it's all about your ability to, uh, to power through when it goes wrong and to grab help. And I've seen so many examples in the region where an entrepreneur finds an angel investor, high net worth individual, uh, they high-five, they're super excited about partnering up together, and then ultimately, as it always does, shit hits the fan in some way or form. Um, and this is obviously not true for everyone, and I'm exaggerating a little, but I've seen a lot of examples of the poor founder now needs to deal with the mess that's created and the problem that has arisen, and babysit an angry investor. Because the angry investor didn't see this coming, doesn't understand it, doesn't know how to explain it because the, the, the risk assessment hasn't matured in the, in, the, in the capital scene. So one of the things that I like to do and that we talk a lot about is how do we educate the early stage investors in their role? And my one-liner there in the workshops I do is you as an angel investor, your role is mother, father, cleaning lady, shoulder to cry on, door opener, cheerleader, and the bank transaction is the easy bit. And once you get that and your role, then the ecosystem starts moving. So that's one. It'll be interesting to see if, uh, what you guys think about that as, as one thing to push the region. The other challenge I see uh, is we want to be the Silicon Valley of the Middle East. I hear it in Beirut, I hear it in Dubai, I hear it in Cairo. And for me, it's kind of irrelevant being uh, the Silicon Valley of the Middle East. We do it in Stockholm as well. We're the Silicon Valley of Europe. It's ne neither here nor there. Let's build businesses instead. Um, and if you too much try to copy the role model of Silicon Valley, you don't get the opportunity to leapfrog a lot of the mistakes that those ecosystems have built. And one of my pet um, issues is the three minute pitch. If you as a founder stand up on stage and give a three minute pitch as one of 20 companies in front of an audience of important investors, you signal an imbalance in the relationship. You act as a child and you ask mama and papa for candy buddy. And the important investor will go, yes, no, maybe, yes, no, maybe. In reality, VCs have LPs, and we need good startups to invest in order for us to hit our objective. It's actually a very equal relationship, the capital with the brain. We raised $26 million. I did not stand on a stage and do three-minute pitches. I met investors on a one-to-one -one basis, had coffee, and looked for partners. Uh, and I think the Middle East uh, has the opportunity to leapfrog a lot of what's going on in the circus and really think about how we connect Brains with capital. Thank you very much. Um, interesting uh, your observations about Silicon Valley there. Of course, in a region that's got so much sand, there's no shortage of silicon. Maybe we should be the silicon region of the world rather than the Silicon Valley. Um, um, Tarek, <coughs> would you like to comment? Sure. Um, look, I think it's important to put things into uh, perspective uh, when we talk about the Middle East, the, uh, the landscape of entrepreneurship in the Middle East and of venture capital has been changing dramatically over the, pa the past 
five to seven years. From 2010 to 2015, the number of investors increased uh, 10 times. Uh, around 70% of those investors focus on, uh, on early stage. Um, <coughs> Over the past three years, from, 2000, or from 2013 to 2015, more likely, the uh, amount invested in the Middle East was uh, in entrepreneurship was $750 million. From 2010 to 2013, the amount invested was $30 million. So it's obviously a very positive trend. Um, now, as trends happen, they make things change in their, uh, in their wake. And one of the uh, things, although I agree a lot with what Roar was uh, saying about the, the VCs, we're starting to see a change in the attitude of VCs because all of a sudden there's more money, there's more money to be invested. Uh, entrepreneurs are learning from each other what to do and what not to do with the, when faced with VCs. So the VCs have to become much more, much more compelling. Now that translates itself into two main things. One, you have fairer or three, uh, three main things. One, fairer valuations. Uh, secondly, you have uh, better term sheets that uh, focus on the exit more than the money going in. And thirdly, VCs scratching their head and say, okay, someone mentioned the term smart capital, and what, what, what is that, and I need to be that. So this is what we're starting to see. So all that is as positive. The issue is that that's gonna take time for us to see the results of that change. Today, some, some of the, probably the three top uh, entrepreneurial companies in the Middle East, I know have huge structural uh, issues in terms of cap tables, and that's going to stand in their way uh, by the time they uh, come to, to exit because the entrepreneur was squeezed so much at the beginning that the last valuations they've had were very, were very high. So for someone to come and uh, buy, buy the companies out so that they can exit, it has to be at a formidable premium from the last round, which is a very high valuation to where the companies are today. So those are structural issues, and that shows you sort of how far, and those are investments those are companies that were started around 2010. So the errors that were committed by VCs in 2010, uh, we're still gonna feel the ripples of them till 2020 once these companies finally get exited because their valuations would be uh, aligned with the expectations of the last investors that, that, that have come in. So that's from a VC thing. I think the, uh, the, the point I'm trying to make is that those errors that VCs have committed in the past are gonna stay with us for a while, and we need to, as an ecosystem, as an ecosystem, we need to, especially stakeholders such as Endeavor, the organization I work with, um, we have to be front and center on making sure we communicate that the, it is changing, when those companies don't exit and they, they start facing issues in the next couple of years because of stuff that happened uh, seven, eight years ago, um, that, that's part of the process, but the new generation of companies are gonna succeed and their investors are coming in at very good uh, uh, structural terms for the, for the entrepreneur. So that's, um, so that's part of it. But you know, I think as an ecosystem, there are other things that were mentioned today that were uh, during, uh, during this afternoon that were very relevant because governments are playing a very big part. Definitely in Lebanon, the government has injected $400 million into the ecosystem that's transformed the ecosystem and that moved us from the uh, fourth or fifth uh, place country in terms of investments in VC in the region to the second just after uh, Dubai. So there is liquidity in the market in Lebanon and in other um, and in other countries in the region. Ecosystems, organizations such as Endeavor, organizations such as WAMDA, or, or organizations um, such as EO are playing a very important role in promoting entrepreneurships and the value of entrepreneurships and mentoring and supporting entre entre entrepreneurs. And as we said, investors are learning and definitely sort of the new generation of entrepreneurs that were entrepreneurs, uh, uh, new generation of investors that were entrepreneurs themselves and have gone through the lessons of being an entrepreneur and that have become investors today are much more entrepreneur uh, friendly. But there's two big elephants in the, uh, in the, in the room and I think they were both uh, touched on today. First one is academia is working as academia. They research, they, they teach but they don't prepare, they don't train uh, 
people to become productive parts of the uh, um, of the of the uh, workforce, as was mentioned by the, by, the, by the keynote speaker, and that's something that's very important. We're starting to see in institutions such as AUB and AUC change the way they're thinking and how they're training uh, people. But there is that shift that needs to happen. And that shift doesn't just happen sort of in the classroom, how you prepare students to become ent entrepreneurs or people, eff effective parts of the, an entrepreneur's uh, team, but also to, um, uh, to create opportunities to cross, fertilize across departments within universities to create research, to create opportunities coming out from universities that are relevant to the local economies that, uh, uh, that, that they're targeting. Because Entrepreneurship has to grow from a fertile soil, and the fertile soil is the need of the economies that they're, that, that they're in. Um, one of the companies in Lebanon, Angami, which is the leading music streaming company in the, uh, in the Middle East, they're part of the Endeavor Network in, uh, in Lebanon, hire people out of AUB, which is the best university in Lebanon, they engineers, fantastic engineering school, they don't get any value out of them until six to nine months because once they come in, they have to teach them everything all over again and how to be, uh, you know, practical parts of their teams. And then they're faced with, you know, the, the, uh, you know, the issues about retaining them in their teams. But if universities played a more important role in preparing people to work with entrepreneurs and be more effective team members, that will make entrepreneur the growth of entrepreneurship much smoother in the region. The other part is also <clears throat> the role that the private sector plays in uh, fermenting innovation and investing in, in innovation. Today we see predominantly consumer apps coming out of the uh, Middle East. We see very very few very few entrepreneurs developing B2B businesses or working with uh, existing companies, existing conglomerates in the Middle East to find solutions with them, innovate with them, use them as key customers, and then taking their solutions and selling it outside, which is also an important part of what, uh, of what entrepreneurship. Uh, Can I, sorry, interrupt there. Why do you think that is? I've always wondered that. I think because that and that goes back to the point that Joe uh, uh, Joe, Joe, Joe mentioned and uh, the, the the gentleman CEO of Jure uh, mentioned. We need the, there isn't a ch there is we need a change in mentality in those big companies. We still think that business is hierarchical. A little innovation is needed. We have a market. We protect that market, but we don't need to uh, to innovate. And that's the. But that's changing. Today we have 16 uh, corporate VCs in the Middle East. Five uh, five years ago there were none. Thank you very much. I think we need to hear from the uh, other panel members. Some interesting observations. That I had in interested in your observations. And for the, for the benefit of doubt, I, I met my wife while we were both undergraduates at the University of Oxford. So, um, I think three things. I think um, if you look at, at talent, I think a lot of talent is here today also in the room. And, and I think uh, 10 years ago, a lot of the Arabs or Middle Eastern who studied like abroad really were seeing themselves abroad. I think that's changing now massively. Um, so for myself, for example, I'm born and raised in Germany of, uh, of uh, Middle Eastern parents. Um, that's a place to be. Yeah. I tell this all the entrepreneurs, we have so many people from Stanford, from, uh, from LBS, from Oxford, etc. And they are coming back because you can have so much more influence here in the, in the, in the Middle East and then in Europe or the US. How high is the probability that you build a startup or company in the US that is influencing millions of people? It's low. Yeah, Maybe it looks nice because Uber and Snap and all these other stuff but it's so much higher in the Middle East. We have a company launched um, one and a half years ago. One of the people here in the, in the um, room is one of the co-founders of it. Today we are doing uh, hundreds of thousands of transactions in a single city in Tehran, in Iran. Um, it changed everything. It has 100,000 drivers under its payroll. Um, everybody knows it. It's changed the lives of hundreds of thousands of people every day. When can you do this if you're 22 or 23 or 24? Can you do it in, in, in Germany? Can you do it in the United States? 
yeah, you could try, but the probability is slow. Uh, doing it in the Arab world, doing it in Iran, doing it in emerging markets, you have such a higher probability to have really impact on the lives of, of hundreds of thousands of people. So that's on talent. And uh, what I tell always talent, I mean, don't wait until like the ecosystem is there. It will not be there. I mean, like, it, it will be hard. It's very hard to raise money, yes. You have to work every day. You have to talk to thousands of people, of investors, and everybody will tell you no. But that's life. You have to do it, and you have to go through it, and, and at the end, you will be successful. Look at Kareem, for example, a company um, founded by two, two, two guys from Dubai. Uh, hundreds of thousands, again, of lives changed with it. Um, and, and, and nobody was believing in what we're, they were doing. When we came to the Middle East, we came to Dubai, we were like 24, 25. We went to the big group, told them, we are building an online fashion company. They said, yeah, yeah, just go, go home again. And we were like, no, it will be huge and it will eat all your market share at some point. They were like, uh, you know that there are malls and people love malls. And uh, six years later, they come to us and are asking us to be partners and how to build it, etc., and, 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 and do it. So, so here's the thing. Don't wait like for governments. Don't wait for like uh, ecosystems, etc. Just do it. Mm -hmm. Go out, work very hard. It's very hard to do, um, but, um, but you, you can do it and you can achieve, um, achieve uh, huge things. Uh, you will never change how people think um, change is not coming because you, you convince people, uh, because all people are dying out, yeah? <laughs> and uh, you are surviving them. So, so that's what you have to do, not like convincing the old people, wait until they die out and do something better. Uh, nothing against old people here, I'm, I'm getting, I think. So um, I think that's, that's on talent. Let me tell you one thing on money. Um, let's tell the local money. Um, I mean, you invest into startups in the Middle East or not, honestly, nobody cares. You will own the f industries of the future or you will not, and somebody else will own it. Look at Souk, for example. Souk, uh, who is investing into the big Middle Eastern companies which will own the industries of the future? It's not Arab companies. It's not Arab investors. They built rather buildings um, a couple of kilometers high or whatever. Um, but then it's owned by, Souk is owned by, uh, not all of them, um, it's owned by Nespers, South, uh, South Africa, by Tiger, United States, um, Karim Investors, Rakuten Invested, yeah? Um, our investors, Nemshi, etc. they are all like JP Morgan, US investors, uh, British, etc. Why? Because the people see that this is the future in these countries. Um, and not like building higher buildings and, and, um, and etc. So, so what I'm saying is, Yes, we need more money in the Middle East from local investors, but honestly, if they are convinced or not, that's their problem. If they are not convinced, they will lose it. They will not own the future industries of the region, um, and somebody else will, will own it. So it's in their benefit. It's not like us and as entrepreneurs to go and, and convince anybody. It's like if they are not being convinced, then it's uh, done for them and, and somebody else will own the industries. Let me tell you one last thing on the market and you ask like what are the problems of these markets. It's a, it's a very simple problem, it's very fragmented. So if you go to Europe, you have very different cultures, very different languages. Um, in, in Germany you have uh, Deutschland sucht den Superstar, Arab, like superstars, whatever. Uh, in England you have a different show, I don't know how you call it here, super talent or whatever. Um, in France, it's different. Nobody watches the same TV shows, etc. Yeah, Shark Tank, okay. Um, in the Arab world, it's different. Like, you have one language, you have a similar culture, um, but everything is very fragmented from a legal perspective. And that, that's the biggest killer for huge entrepreneurial um, work. In, in, in Germany, you have to build a startup for Germany, for France, for UK, etc. It's very hard to build it for one market here. You, in, in the Middle East, you can build, like, companies for one 300 million people market, but then it's very fragmented um, and, and very hard, um, and, and that stops innovation, right? I mean, you can't be innovative in a market like only UAE with 8 million people or 7 million people. Then you go to the United States, you have 300 million people. You can be innovative in China and in India, um, but it's very hard to be in a fragmented market. So I think for us entrepreneurs, it's again, we have to deal with it. So we open in 20 countries. Uh, companies, but what uh, would make it much, much easier is simply to allow 
um, to overcome fragmentation in the legal systems, in the logistics, um, and, um, and and similar topics. So yes, I think that's uh, to, to summarize. I think it's um, it's the best place to be. Like for all entrepreneurs here in the room, go to the Middle East. Uh, don't wait until somebody solves your problems. Uh, do it yourself, and uh, change and change uh, these countries and the economies of this, uh, because you can do it with very very little means. Yeah. Thank you very much, Hammer. I'm not going to be as controversial as Iyad, but uh, <laughs> I think the word disruption uh, is, 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 is very important here because as much as we had so many businesses that talked about disruption, introducing new ideas, coming into the market with innovative ways of reaching their clients, we haven't seen that from the uh, Arab countries' governments. They haven't been equally disruptive. Uh, looking at some of the regulatory environments that exist, they are not as conducive, with the exception of some very interesting initiatives like the ones we listened to from Sharjah that has been incubating and helping young entrepreneurs and also the youth. Very interesting approach with the 12 to 17. But giving you an example from Egypt, the regulatory environment does not really support uh, startups. The regulatory environment to a great extent doesn't support existing business, so they cannot support startups. <laughs> and to be politically correct, there are attempts, there are initiatives along the lines of supporting the, the new entrepreneurs uh, that talk about tax reform, that talk about uh, enabling them to register companies, but in, as a matter of fact, with a 7,000-year-old bureaucracy, it's a bit difficult for someone who's 21 or 23 or 24 to overcome such bureaucracy. And I think that it's about time that the Arab government starts thinking of being disruptive. And being disruptive in a way that hasn't been seen before in supporting the young entrepreneurs. The population of young entrepreneurs uh, comes from some very interesting demographic numbers. 60% of the Arab world is below 30. Egypt has 100 million people, so we're talking about a huge amount that is seeking job opportunities, the highest unemployment that's uh, been recorded in Egypt. We have faced a lot of challenges in the past five years. I have to say that on the financing side, the government has been trying hard to provide some financing packages for young entrepreneurs, for startups, but still the, the official uh, venues or channels for, for delivery to young entrepreneurs are weak at this stage. The money is there. There is huge liquidity in the banks in Egypt. Huge liquidity, both on the non-banking financial side and on the ba banking financial side. But delivery is very weak at that stage. Um, I have been on the side of running after venture capitalists. I have been doing that before I started the company and being a co-founder of the company. And then a year ago, I found myself sitting on the other side. I was approached by a couple of businesses one of them by a very beautiful soul, and an, an amazing engineer who's 23, who came up with a fabulous idea in the sharing economy area. Not along the lines of Kareem or Uber, but thinking of the sharing economy, and she had a, she had a magnificent idea, but she felt very scared of approaching any business model or venture capitalist, so she disappeared for a year. She came back six months ago, and we started to talk together, and I think that being on the other side of, of, of the fence at one stage of your life gives you a high learning curve. Uh, we were shut down by venture capitalists, private equity firms. One of them I saw in a conference and I told them, you shut us down, but we're a successful company. And, and he was extremely polite and said, look, if you want to do something else, you've proven yourself. I was too old, actually, at that stage to start something. But as I said, you're never too old to get the spark again. So you have to be understanding to the needs of the startups. And I think that this is something that's emerging. I, I tend to disagree with you that it's not just in, in, in non-Arab countries, but actually I think there is, a, there, there, there is a new wave that started in 2011 where the youth were empowered and, and, and wanted to make a change. They were empowered by, by, by a movement that, 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 that seeked to, to achieve something, and this empowerment translated into economic empowerment and, and, and getting an idea that 
we can do something. And I think that five years ago, this is when it started. I mean, you know about that more than me, but I think if you, if you trace that back statistically, it is actually, it has started five years ago. And I think today we have organizations in Egypt that are coming from the private sector that supports innovation, that supports incubation, that supports startups. For example, Flat Six Labs in Jazz. These are just examples that come off the top of my head. And you have individuals who want to do that. You've seen them all. You've seen Riham. I know you know Riham very well. So these are people that that even went beyond startups, but went into the field of assisting other startups and helping startups be incubated properly. Um, passion. I have not seen passion like I've seen in the past three years amongst Egyptian youth that I've been seeing lately. They provide me personally with so much energy. They have provided me personally with, with, with so much positive energy to go forward and move ahead, and we never had that when we were young. We were not given the proper enabling environment. As I said earlier, it was just a good job at a good financial institution or a good job at Schlumberger or PNG, and these were the leading names, or Oraskom, so that I don't go wrong here. And, 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 and these were the aspiration of the youth at that stage, and EFG ultimately at that stage, so, uh, because there wasn't any discussion about any startup innovation, enabling environments. Um, and I think that it's about time that each government, coming back to, 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 to the role of government, does something along the lines of Sharjah. I have to be critical also that you don't face the same challenges we have. You have 20,000 graduates to try and find jobs in a city that already has 200,000 people. So while we have a multiplier of 100 times of that. And that's why I'm saying that shared experiences have to be done across the board. You have to reach out to governments because you also have, uh, you have a flexible way, more flexible way of doing things. And, and I think this is, this is the time where, if I want to brand my statement, this is the time where governments have to be disruptive. They have to be equally disruptive as there are new ideas that are disruptive in the economies, new ideas about youth being disruptive, so they have to come up with new regulatory environments that are disruptive, new ways of dealing with youth that is disruptive, financing mechanisms that are disruptive. And, and I think this is, you need a champion. You always need a champion in the Arab world. It's, it's not just institutional like, like other countries. You do need a champion. And, and, and if it doesn't come through a champion, sometimes it doesn't come through. And champions could be the youth, not necessarily from the public sector figures, and not necessarily from the young people. Yeah, and you get some old people, some wisdom. <laughs> so, so, I mean, that, that, that's how I want to end the statement, that I, I think to be disruptive and, and, and to take this learning curve and the energy of the youth and, uh, and try to help as much as we can. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, uh, it's, uh, uh, I'd love to hear you, my friend, when you are being controversial. It's actually being uncontroversial, but uh, thank you very much. <laughs> we, uh, we're, we're pretty well out of time, actually, but I'm sure we've got time for w one question to seed some discussion amongst our p panel here. Whoever's going to have this question, the pressure is on you. This has got to be a really good question because it's probably going to be the only one we've got. Who's going to pick somebody for the really good question, please? <clears throat> There's yeah, somebody there who's desperate to ask, ask the really good question. I can see a purple arm. <clears throat> good luck. Uh, too much pressure on me. So, um, question directed towards... You Iyad. ask your question, my friend. One, one of our colleagues will answer it. Oh, yeah, so, actually to Iyad, so, was your question to provoke people or was it to ignite a response? Which one was it? Which one? The question regarding why aren't there any um, UAE champions coming through? For example, China had Jack Ma, yeah? So uh, coming back to what Amar is saying, the, for the ecosystem to flourish, you need a champion, someone like Jack Ma or uh, Mark Zuckerberg or whatever. So where is this next champion? Uh. I mean, we have champions in the, in the Middle East, a lot of champions. I mean, like great entrepreneurs uh, who build huge companies, be it Souk, be it Karim, be it Namshi, et cetera. We have, uh, we have these champions. And the thing is, um, nobody, I mean, don't wait for the governments, yeah? I mean, maybe they will be disruptive. We know for 100 years that Arab 
governments are not disruptive. Um, so, so, so these people are not enabled by governments, are not enabled by anyone else and by themselves and by the beliefs that they can do it. Um, so don't wait for anybody. It's, uh, it's up to, to, to us. To, to to whoever is uh, responsible to make it uh, to make it work and it's it's a fight it's a fight every day for all these entrepreneurs um, and and uh, but they are there and uh, they have built huge companies I mean Souk there might be a lot of problems etc it's a multi-billion dollar company built um, by a Syrian guy um, Kareem built by a Pakistani um, and a Swede and a Swedish guy. <laughs> um, He's yeah. He's no more Arab. I think than Swedish. Um, so so it, it can be done and and it is be done and don't wait. Just do it. I just like Thank to comment you, on just, the sorry. Just, can I just, just comment yeah. on the bureaucracy thing? What do you think is the headline today in Stockholm in Sweden? Bureaucracy. Bureaucracy. Spotify is in a huge open public uh, dispute with the government about uh, work laws and uh, issues with their employees. It happens everywhere. It's not an excuse. I agree with you. Build a company wherever you are. Bureaucracy happens. And, and I'm interested in this notion of champions. Do we need champions? I think the problem with an occasion like this is we have people on the platform uh, raised three feet above the ground. Entrepreneurship is not about Zuckerberg. Zuckerberg is an exception, not the rule. If we all see Zuckerberg as what we want to turn ourselves into, we will never stimulate entrepreneurship. Was it Brecht who says, unhappy the world who needs heroes? We don't need heroes, we don't need champions. Uh, when, when I talked about champions, and don't get me wrong here, yeah. it's always, there's always one Cristiano Ronaldo or one Messi, but that doesn't mean that everybody should not aspire to, uh, to be uh, an excellent football player or to join uh, a club in La Liga. But when I talk about the government being dis disruptive, it's because we do need governments to be supportive. We, we should not neglect this reality. It doesn't mean that if the government is not supportive, we're going to stop and say, oh, we're going to blame them and we're not going to go forward. But you do indeed need a supportive regulatory environment. Some, some of the entrepreneurs I've seen in Egypt have went to Dubai have went to, uh, some of them are actually thinking of Beirut right now because the, there are there are very good rules mm -hmm. there. If you're going to say that the government is if, if, if Lebanon is the benchmark of good governance, no, no, no. <laughs> things must be really bad. <laughs> no, I'm, just saying, I'm just saying that, that this tells you how bad it is. I mean, so it's this, the bad uh, spectrum, it. so it's the best of the worst. You can name it whatever you like, but yeah. just to, to qualify my statement, ultimately, it will provide a huge impact if the governments are also involved in this movement. Yeah. Absolutely. Like as I, long I, I as they don't oversubsidize yeah. the market. Like I think it's important, the government uh, has an important role, but if anything we've shown in Lebanon is that company entrepreneurs can succeed when there's absolutely no government, there's vacuums, no laws are being passed, because what you need is an internet connection, and ours is much worse than the internet connections in, uh, in Egypt, capital and access to people. And the way we've done it, and I think it's a very important point, is it relates back to the champions part. We don't have uh, champions in, uh, in, in Lebanon. We don't have, uh, you know, we don't have an Alibaba. We don't have a, um, a Zuckerberg. We don't have a Facebook. But what we do have is we have a very strong diaspora that is becoming more and more engaged mm -hmm. in what the country is uh, doing. Every year for the past uh, three years, we've organized a summit with LIFE, which is the network of Lebanese in, uh, uh, finance internationally, to engage them, w engage the Lebanese and the diaspora with what's happening in the, uh, in the country. And every year it gets better, every year it gets stronger, and it becomes much more dynamic because they see what, how the country is evolving, they see how the companies that they were meeting the previous years have grown, and the potential for them as business people to be part of that journey. So that's really Im important. Now, there are other Lebanese that we can bring in to motivate. Doni Fadel, the uh, the founder of Nest, the designer of the iPhone, is in Lebanon now, is, is in Lebanon every few months talking about entrepreneurship and pushing the sales forward, but his involvement is much less important than the importance of the people outside that are helping the companies grow in the absence of uh, government. And you also Egypt have a generational spirit of entrepreneurship. <laughs> No, there's uh, there's that as well, but Egypt has the, uh, the the same. There are fantastic Egyptian entrepreneurs all over the world, not least the founders of Tilt that just 
got bought out by by Airbnb. Well, actually, uh, the, the 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 latest statistics is showing that the growth rate of uh, startups in terms of innovation and entrepreneurs from Egypt is the highest in the Arab world in terms of percentage. No. Now imagine if this is also working in a more enabling environment. I agree with you, if there are no laws, it's even better. But if there are laws that no. actually are becoming no. more as an obstacle, and you can tell how far we can go if these laws are not there. That's what I'm saying, reform. I'm talking about reform. I'll, I'll tell you as an anecdote. For, so the, the thing in Lebanon is always the government is not there, the government does nothing, and because of that we can't grow our entrepreneurial ecosystem. Um, recently, I was invited to be part of a task force by the new prime minister to see how do we empower the entrepreneurial ecosystem and how we grow it. So we reached out to the, to, to the players and the, the stakeholders, and we said, what would you like the government to do? And what they said, don't be involved, don't do anything. <laughs> so that's... We never, uh, and on that note, I'm afraid somebody's shouting at me already in my ear. <laughs> it's not my fault, my friend, we started 10 minutes late. We're finishing 10 minutes late. We're on time. Thank you very much, panel. Thank you for <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> <Yeah. laughs> contributing.